We spend a lot of time writing loops, but we have to also think about how to read them. Remember that because of the way these languages work and because of the English meanings of words like while, uh, it's really easy for humans when they glance at code, especially code that they didn't write, to make a bunch of assumptions about what it does. And it's really important in this course that we be able to objectively understand code without making assumptions. So uh, the typical way we could verify that is to ask you to um, take a piece of code and tell me what output it produces. Or I could say something like, on line 17, what is the value of this variable? Or where is the first place in the program that the variable b gets a value greater than 100? Something like that. So this is a very basic uh, sort of tracing exercise. And what I'm going to do is, um, if this were asked on an old-fashioned paper exam, I'd tell people, write out your answer. Um, I'm going to type my answer out because I have a feeling that if you take a look at these print statements that print out three values per line, my messy handwriting is going to get, um, uh, is, we're going to lose patience for that quickly. So I'll type the output out here. And so the goal of a question like this is trace the program, run this code by hand. I want to walk through the program just like the computer would, but without using the compiler, I want to, I want to determine exactly what output it would produce. Um, and then, of course, because I have the code in front of me, I can always just, I can verify my answer by running the code and, and making sure I have it. But we need to be able to do this by hand. So it, the, it does give a nice hint. Oh, good. Draw a diagram. Well, that sounds like that sounds like a great idea. Um, so uh, I'm going to draw my diagram over here as I trace through. And like I've mentioned in, a, in uh, one of the recent videos, I, I'm going to begin when I draw my diagrams. Always uh, when I'm inside of the curly brackets associated with main, I'm going to put that inside a box named main, and each variable goes in there. And we'll learn this has something to do with a concept called scope. Uh, okay, so I'm in main and I'm sitting on top of line 12 and on line 12 I create a new variable named a and it is an int and I set it to 6 and then I will, I'll go through line 13 and 14 as well. So there's b and there's c. Uh, one of the reasons it's important to train the next generation of programmers is that I'm hoping somebody can write a better piece of software for drawing on the screen because all of my other drawing programs are great, but I can't draw on top of my screen like this. Um, okay, so I have those. Uh, A is 6, B is 10, and C is 0. Okay, so I've gotten to the end of line 14, and I'm sitting on line 15, and the first line of output is print start, and I guess I'll type it in my box down here, so I print start A equals, and then percent D, so I go grab the first thing out of the list. Oh, it's the value of A, which is 6. So A equals 6, B equals 10, C equals 0. And then I go on. <clears throat> so that's the end of line 15. Now I get to line 16, which is the while statement. And I look at that yes or no question. Is A less than B? And I actually encourage you, I know it seems obvious here, write in the values of A and B on top of the less than sign to give yourself, to, so it's easier for you to, to just see right through the answer. So is 6 less than 10? And the answer is yes, it is. And because the answer is yes, we execute the, in, we, whoops, we execute the entire loop body. And then we come back up and ask the question again. So a equals a plus 2. We know the rules for assignment statements. We have to completely ignore the left-hand side. The value of a is 6. 6 plus 2 is 8. And then I erase the left-hand side and I put 8 in a. And by now you might see that maybe we don't need to diagram out the entire assignment if it's that simple. If the right-hand side were any more complicated, we need to diagram it out at least once through the program to make sure we haven't missed anything. Okay, so a is 8. And then on line, <clears throat> on line 18, I get down to my next output statement, which says, uh, let's see, in space, um, a equals, okay, so it's the same thing. I verify that it is the same as above. I just print the values of a, b, and c. So I don't, I don't have to pay too careful attention to that once I, once I have the hang of it. Uh, a equals 8, b equals 10, c equals 0. All right, and then I get I, I work my way down to line 19. B equals B minus 1. Okay, so I don't think I'll diagram this out. It's pretty clear I take 10 and I change that to 9. And then line 20, C equals C plus 1. So that means that this is no longer 0. It is now 1. And then I go back around. Whenever I hit the closing bracket of a while loop, I must 
I absolutely have, uh, uh, there's no option but to uh, go back to the top of the loop and ask the question again. Even if you think the loop is over, you still have to go and ask this question again. And it'll be significant. We'll notice that there are ways later in the course where even on this line, when we're asking this yes or no question, A or B could be changed by this. So if we don't remember to ask the question again, we may not get the right answer. So I ask the question again, is A less than B? And you might notice, because the values of A and B are just sitting in my diagram, it's really easy for me to answer this. I don't have to do any thinking. I do have to remember that the value of B is actually 9. So uh, 8 is less than 9, uh, and that means the answer to the yes or no question was yes, and so I go inside the loop body again. A equals A plus 2. Okay, so to take the 8, change that to a 10. And then I print out in, and I print the values of A, B, and C. In space A equals 10. Whoops, that's not A. A equals 10, B equals 9, and C equals 1. And then I hit line 19, B equals B minus 1. Okay, so B was 9, change it to 8. And on line 20, C equals C plus 1. So I change C, oops, I change C to 2. All right, and then I hit this, and I have to go around again. Okay, so I ask the question, is it the case that, so, the expression a, a less than, got to commit to my less than sign, a less than b, well, that's like asking, is it the case that 10 is less than 8? And the answer is, no, it isn't. And so the loop is now over. So I go down to after the closing curly bracket, and that takes me to line 22. And on line 22, just like before, I print out end, and then I print out the three variables. So a equals 10, b equals 8, and c equals 2. And I'll... Uh, Get rid of that. Uh, okay, so this is my apparent, based on my tracing, this is the output I think the program has. Remember that in an exam setting, regardless of what you might think, we can design questions such that you will not necessarily have the ability to run the code to get the answer. And I know you're sitting here thinking, but, but Bill, if you ask me a code question, how, am I, how are you going to keep me from running the code? Well, there are questions I could have asked where it's not as easy as just give the entire output of the program. And you should expect on midterms, you might also get questions like, what line, what is the first line of code where the variable has a value that's this big? Or what's the value of B the first time A is 10 or greater? So remember that we don't always have the compiler to validate, but when we're practicing our code tracing, we can always use the compiler to help us out. So I'm going to put this over here so you know what, what I think the answer is, and then we'll see whether I actually got the right answer. Uh, and I really recommend if you want to use a compiler to help you validate your answers, do not look at the real output until you have the whole result sitting in front of you that you computed. Because you need to become familiar with the process of tracing the whole program without a net, without already knowing you're on the right track. I believe if you use a diagram, if you keep things organized, it isn't that tough as long as you practice. Okay, so we'll try running this code so that we'll compile it. I'll just Compile it again, okay, and then I will run the code, so it's loop tracing, and we'll stare at it. Okay, so A equals 6, B equals 10, C equals 0, that looks good. 8, 10, 0, that looks good. 10, 9, 1, that looks good. 10, 8, 2. Okay, so I did get the right answer. And what I'm hoping to prove, especially in the next couple of weeks as we talk about scope, is that you might think, yes, it seems a little bit unnecessary to draw this diagram over here because it seems like there's a bit too much aesthetics to it. Why don't I just jot down numbers? Why don't I just write, okay, 10, okay, now A is 7, and then, okay, A is 8. It turns out that the better, and this is actually interesting because it comes up not only in how do I teach programming, but how do you design good applications? What is a good way of designing a door handle? It's actually a psychological thing. The cleaner the, the visualization is, the more obvious it is to you where everything is, and the uh, less extraneous information there is, the more likely it is that your brain won't short circuit and come up with the wrong answer. This diagram contains everything the computer knows at each step and literally nothing else. If you try and jot stuff down in margins, so I write you know, a equals 7, okay, now a equals 8. But okay, is, does a equals 7 or a equals 8? If you just jotted stuff down, you might get confused. And, it's, and you make one of those mistakes in the middle of a program, and the rest of the output is probably broken. So you have to do more thinking to figure out what you mean, and you still might not get the right answer. There's still a chance for error. 
Now, there's also cases where the computer does something that your human brain wouldn't expect. So, for example, we saw that integer division, if I say what's 3 over 2 and the two things are ints, I don't get 1.5. Um, and using a diagram can help us with that too, because if we only ever trust what the diagram says, it's less likely that we'll let our own assumptions get in the way. So you might think drawing this diagram requires a bit too much work. Why don't I just jot stuff down? The diagram is a way of keeping stuff organized. And I'm hoping if you try it out, you'll notice if it's drawn well, it sort of does the work for you. All the work it takes to draw it pays off because you have to do way less thinking when you're actually tracing the code. And certainly as we go forward and see scope, we'll notice that it can pay off because it can help us avoid, uh, I guess, I don't know, obvious uh, mental blocks that get in the way of the way that we think about uh, variables and values in C.